Welcome, friends of all designs, to Elevator Pitch. I am your host, Paul, and joining me today is my ever-present friend, James. Hey, everyone. And also joining us is Kalen Gorski of Blackland, because the webcam's not working. So instead... Hello, everybody. Let's bring up... <laughs> he, he now looks like Functronic Labs, which is where he works. Uh, and you are working on the upcoming Nova... 111 or 111, or as I like to say, Nova 111. 111, I like that. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, 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 uh, what is, um, tell us about Nova 111. What is it? Okay, so we, we started working on it uh, a couple of months ago. And, okay, so the story is uh, there were scientists working in a, in a turn based world. And, uh, they wanted to speed up their research, so they started researching real time. And uh, they scienced too hard, and the two worlds kind of got mixed together in a, in a terrible science accident. And so the result of that is a, a game where uh, you have to go around and rescue the scientists in your, your trusty little rescue ship. And uh, the core of the game is turn based, but it mixes in real time elements. And there's 111 scientists to rescue. Uh, that's what the number is. Uh, so you've got a mix of real time and kind of turn-based stuff. How does that mix go together? Okay, so I guess in the in the trailer there, you saw the uh, the spikes that fall down, and uh, so they fall in real time. So you can imagine that if you've stopped, actually, is the screen share working? Can not see anything on your end at the moment. So, uh oh. <laughs> if you imagine that the spikes are falling in real time, because the game is turn based and all the enemies move in sync with you, uh, if you don't move, then uh, the enemies can't move as well, and so you can sort of the environment to their advantage. Yeah, so there's the spikes falling there we've got now. So they, they fall in real time while enemy movement so is if I don't move, yeah, they still fall on me. Yeah. So, for example, if I stop here, the enemy can't move and, and oh, I can switch spike falls on me. <laughs> oh. There we go. <laughs> now we can see <laughs> Yeah. Okay so, so, okay, so there's some elements that will basically ignore the, the turn-based nature of it and, and some that, that kind of have to conform to it. Yeah, so, so it's it, just a bit... So in a in a turn based game you have a lot of uh, freedom to, to think about what you want to do and, and strategize. But if you mm. if you add time pressure, it kind of mixes up the gameplay a lot. Kind of like speed mm. chess, I suppose. Um, so something that you're normally very comfortable with tackling, like a certain enemy or something, when you just add when you make the player rush, it can become a stressful situation very mm. quickly. Mm. And have you found kind of some interesting ways to use that past sort of, uh, you know, just sort of item that will move out of turn? Um, it, it basically just makes uh, the kind of regular encounters more more stressful and, mm. and kind of action feel. Mm. And, uh, yeah, yeah, I, I guess it does get really more complicated than that. Yeah, so he, he damages in real time, so, you know, you want to rush and defeat this guy. Mm. So all all of the enemies have a, a way to defeat them without taking any damage. So for this guy, it's, it's you rush at him and, and kill him quickly, but if you take a lot of turns in, in succession, then all of the enemies as well are going to be able to take a lot of turns. So, mm. you know, some, some simple enemies combined with a latch can suddenly be a, a really dangerous situation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, there's um there's a power up system and stuff in the game. How is that functioning? I heard a f I've read a few things where it almost they suggest it's almost Castle um, Metroidvania ish in that you can get new abilities and such. So by defeating the enemies, they drop uh, poly gel. We called it, which is I guess a basic currency for upgrade. <clears throat> and uh, the the upgrades are they kind of change your playstyle a little bit, so you can use some of the abilities and sort of. Uh, focus your power on the, the play style that you like. But most of the, the power that comes is from understanding the mechanics of the enemies. Mm. So 
yeah, it, it's not as as strongly like upgrade based as a lot of other games, but uh, you can sort of customize your playstyle a bit. So if you prefer the the laser, for example, then turn on some of the abilities. Ah, yes, a good way of getting abilities. <laughs> so you know you have this laser that that shoots, and uh, if you if you put extra points into it, you can charge it up for a, a stronger and slightly longer laser. You know if that's the kind of play style that you like. Mm. So um, is levels in this? Is it uh, are they design levels? Are they randomized? Is it... So the original prototype we started with some random level generation, but it. I don't know, we, we couldn't quite get something as fun as we were hoping, so we ended up mm. making an editor to test like what kind of combinations of things are interesting, and uh, it turned out to be a, a better route to make more interesting levels, so as our, as our first game for the studio, we, you know, if it looks like a, a good way to take something and get the game shipped faster, it's a better choice for us. The whole thing, even though it's sort of got these roguelike action elements in it, um, just from looking at it, I mean, but it also really seems to be more of a puzzle game, at least yeah, the way so there's, a, there's kind of a feel of a puzzle in, in the way you defeat the enemies, um, mm. just sort of abusing positioning to, to your advantage and not getting trapped in a corner, and just sort of learning the idiosyncrasies of how each of the enemies behave. They're all, they're all slightly different. And uh, none of them on their own are really complicated, but it kind of takes a few encounters to get the hang of it. But you can definitely feel that when when you encounter something that you uh, have encountered a bunch of times, you, you feel in control of the situation, which is uh, mm. yeah, a, a nice feeling. Mm. It almost makes you think a little bit, I'm going to say a little bit Dark Souls, where once you learn the patterns of the enemies, they're really less of an issue. Yeah, yeah. So that, but then in so the combination, they can... You know, in a different circumstance, they can suddenly be mm. dangerous again. So yeah, I mean, this guy just dashes at you. He's very simple. <laughs> but so how, how many different kinds of uh, enemy behaviors can we expect? So I, I guess in the first world, there's about uh, there's about ten to twelve different enemies. Mm. Okay. And then sort of variations of them will be introduced in that mm. the later stages. Um, so, so the first world is kind of a this canyon style where it teaches you the basic mechanics of the game and introduces all the the time elements. Like for example, the abilities like oh no that'll crash, like the time stop, which lets you take as many turns as you can before the the ability runs out. Oh uh, yeah. <laughs> um, Just rush through time. Yeah. So we have, but that stops all the real time elements as well. So I mean, you can stop spikes mid fall and and do kind of interesting things with that. Um, the the also, you can always well, get like three layers of time at that point. Kind of, yeah. It gets. Yeah. We have some other experiments because the the time stop is actually like on a sliding scale, so we can we can slow down time as well and speed it up, mm. and mm. it kind of gets probably more complicated uh, than is enjoyable to deal with. So we're just doing stop at the moment, but. I, I kind of think maybe some uh, time slow rooms and stuff like that might be some interesting experiments. But what yeah, about time loops? We need time loops. Time loops. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> but what is paradox? <laughs> I'm just trying to think. I'll, I'll try and make it. I'll see what I can do. <laughs> That's so, all uh, we ask. All we ask is that you make the game infinitely more complex at our will. <laughs> So the thing is, we you know we've done a bunch of experiments uh, with some you know different ideas, but to introduce new players and especially for demoing the game, uh, you can't really throw in too much complex time stuff at the start because all of the elements are simple on their own. But you know to introduce them all to a new player, it's it's kind of overwhelming. Mm, yeah, it definitely seems like something you need to layer up. Uh, yeah. Otherwise, it could be a little overwhelming. But I can definitely see a lot of potential for that mechanic and making me think about the world and the way things move through it pretty differently. Yeah, I think it, I think it mixes up in interesting ways. The The second world is a uh, will be a laboratory style. So there'll be a lot more... I, I don't want to say a, a puzzle style, but there'll be a lot more kind of like thinking stuff. You know, mm -hmm. There might be some invincible enemies that destroy other enemies that move in turn based so you, you can kind of use them to your advantage you know maybe some like we have some like sentry gun tests that you know shoot at you but they also will hit the enemies and 
you know, some of them might be in real time. You might have like switches that turn them on and off in real time. So you might want to hit a switch and then run through a room while that sentry's off mm. uh, to get to the other side. And I think it'll it'll have a little bit of a Zelda dungeon vibe. Um, but I don't know. I guess more more grid, <laughs> more more turns and grids. <laughs> And so how, how long is a, a level? Uh, so I guess the level I just played through is is one scene. So uh, yeah. from the from the world map, one of the scenes is four or five. Oh, sorry, one of the stages is four or five of these scenes. So mm. maybe maybe 10 to 15 minutes. And then uh, each of the worlds is, I guess, I guess about five or six of, of these uh, stages. It's the kind of thing I could see could lead to some really interesting speed runs when people just try to figure out the optimal way to use the environment to get through. Yeah. Uh, so when we were, we actually had a really horrible crash that we were debugging uh, that that kept showing up in our GDC demoing, which was great. But to test that, we, we found a way to repro it that we had to run through the whole first and second stage. Uh, and yeah, it kind of made me think that speed running it would be kind of fun. So. I, I agree. <laughs> uh, yeah, just having to manage those kind of the duality of of or I need to I need to move to make things move, but that could kind of screw me. Then there are other things which are happening in real time. It's it's it is a very interesting mishmash of having to kind of understand the world in different ways. Uh, that's that's pretty cool. Yeah, I think it, it kind of tickles your brain in a, a way that not many games do. It's, mm. it's kind of fun. There's a, there's a good feeling of. Uh, yeah, mastery over over the game elements that you acquire. Mm. So I find I, um, I I'm watching just you you going through the game quite a lot now. It's actually very distracting to have on the podcast. I'm just mesmerized <laughs> by watching the game. Um, but also just the uh, the fog of war that you've got. It seems really really strict. Like just before I noticed you went behind a tree and then you couldn't see the enemy. That was only a few blocks oh, yeah. away now and everything. That's uh that's also seems like just another complication on top that's really interesting to the whole point. Uh. Yeah. Are you still playing around with the ideas of the fog of war and stuff in there? Um, how has that affected the design at this point? So I guess there's like there's two layers. There's the the dark green area where you haven't been before, and then there's the the grayed out area where uh, you can't see at the moment. Um, we just kind of went with uh, what felt natural from RTS games. Mm -hmm. uh, we we haven't really abused it so much for for actual game mechanics, but I'm I'm always open to experimentation. So that might play more into the actual gameplay. But generally, uh, yeah, the stuff that you're seeing that you can see is the stuff that you're interacting with, so... Mm. Hey, you've also mentioned that uh, audio is going to play a pretty big part in this with sort of dynamic music and things like that. How, how have you used music in this one? So at the moment we have a basic system when there's uh, enemies around, the kind of the tempo picks up and it layers on some other stuff. Mm. Um, We'll keep experimenting with, with what we can, uh, working with our audio guy, Jack Menhorn, uh, as we go along, but it'll probably end up being more simple than than uh, complicated. Maybe some filters or, or things like that when you're in the time stop to sort of give it a different mm. feel. Well, um, your your team's had a bit of a history with experimental audio stuff as well. Haven't they? Like um, Lotus was uh, like a leap controlled thing that was like the first thing that came out, if I'm not mistaken. So, so uh, the, the founder of Functronic, Eddie Lee, uh, he, he does all the, all the audio, visual, and graphical stuff. Uh, I do more of the gameplay programming yeah, stuff. Yeah, um, yeah he, he did a couple of projects with the Leap Motion, and uh, yeah, I mean, they, they were fun and experimental. Uh, uh, it, it seems like a little space that you, you and um, sort of Q Games, which is it? Is everyone that's at uh, Functronic from Q Games traditionally, or is it sort of a mixture of people there? Um, it's just actually the two of us at the moment. Oh. And so yeah, all of us. I should are ask how many. <laughs> uh, well, we, it's only we're two of you. You need to put your bio on the site too, because it's just about Eddie. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I need to update that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So uh, we, we're contracting a few people for like the artwork. Mm -hmm. Um, and the yeah. sound and stuff. Um, but yeah, yeah it's, uh, it's cool. like yeah. Eddie did some work on Pixel Junk 4 AM. Uh, some of the really nice visualizers. Yeah. I, I just realized I'm running around in circles because it's so it's 
This game it's hard to play and talk at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> but I can I can dodge without really just just dodge shots without really. Yeah, just it. dodge forever. That's all we need to see. Um, so, the the dash yeah. ability is great because uh, in a game like this, like the the laser seems very strong because you can shoot things, but it mm. it kind of turns out that the dash, which is kind of like a teleport blink, uh, I think it ends up being more powerful because. Mobility and positioning ends up being a uh, you know a very Some strong part of. Yeah. I'm gonna set off this bomb so that he hits the other guys. Now he's gonna tick down in real time, so if I just wait, they're they're all at the. the oh, and leave the other guys next to him. Yeah, they can't get out of the way. Uh, that's cool. So um yeah, you, you guys are based in Kyoto. Um, yep. at the moment you you attended uh, Bit Summit relatively recently. Wasn't it? Yeah, uh, just before yeah. GDC, so it was no time for rest. <laughs> <laughs> so that was, uh, that was three days of showing off the game and uh, mm. explaining it many, many times in English and Japanese. But the yeah, it was really great to to see everyone play and get lots of feedback and see the areas where we need to improve, especially the the first player experience. Uh, mm. For people who haven't really played roguelikes before, uh, some of the concepts, just the g general turn concept, can be a bit tricky mm. to convey. Um, Especially because we, we want to try and make it easy to understand without having to <clears throat> without having to read anything. Yeah. Um, mm. Yeah. Bit Summit was great. Uh, the the first year of Bit Summit was was quite small, um, but this year was was quite big, and uh, I expect next year will be even better. Hmm. Because that's um independent gaming's always had a development. Sorry, has always had a strange uh, place in Japan. So it's nice seeing Bit Summit sort of bring more attention to those. Sorry. Yeah, I think a couple of articles alluded to it, but uh, I don't think many people here were really thought that you could strike out on your own and and mm -hmm. make be a legitimate developer it was a like it didn't seem like a viable path. It was like something you did in your spare time while working at somewhere. So I think mm -hmm. I think all the devs seeing uh, other people, you know like striking out and making indie games kind of maybe will inspire them to do the same, which I, I think will lead to some cool games. So I think there's lots of, you know, cool and quirky Japanese devs with great ideas. Yeah, it's it's it seems that since since the scope of gaming got especially kind of triple A gaming got so huge that there seems to be less stuff sort of coming out of Japan, at least for the for the Western market. But it, I'm sort of hoping that now we've almost had a bit of a reset with What's required to get a game out there uh, for an indie dev? You know, you got you like two guys who are kind of contracting some stuff out. That yeah. hopefully, hopefully, we'll see sort of a return to that. You know, there's really unique uh, Japanese titles again. Like, do you have you seen like a, a growing indie scene personally in Kyoto? Uh, so, so another guy I used to work with, he started doing a Kyoto indie meetup uh, mm. once a month or so. There's another one this Friday. And uh, it started off, you know, like eight people a couple of months ago, and then I think the the one last month was maybe 30, 40 people. So wow, I think just making a place for people to come to it's it's slowly uh, building up. There's a lot of foreigners. If you build it, they will come. Slowly, basically, yeah. <laughs> but you know, each week there's there's more Japanese people coming along, which is great. Um, so yeah, I I think the dev scene here will will build slowly. Yeah. Uh, that's, yeah, that's good to see. Now, um, oh, I've lost my thought of train. Sorry about that. Um, uh, with um, you came came Q Games. You were working. We mentioned uh, what was not now Nom Nom Galaxy. You did early work on that, correct? Yep. So uh, yeah. Uh, yep. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I, mean, every, I think the delay making it awkward. We keep cutting each other off. Um, you, 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 feel free. Go ahead. Oh, so yeah, uh, we started working on the original prototype, and uh, yeah, I mean, inspired by lots of sandbox games and some things we wanted to kind of change and improve in the the genre of sandbox. Um, mm. You know, li little things like managing a ridiculous inventory of meaningless items, <laughs> like 500 kinds of dirt, <laughs> and uh, yeah, we, we wanted to simplify some of those mechanics and just sort of, you know bring up the pace of, mm. of the, the base building and stuff. Uh, yeah, because I, I thought it was interesting when I was first looking at Nova that um, it, it's sort of like... It's a, it's like a, a change of pixel junk shooter. 
yeah. where you're like collecting the sun, you're ca- getting the scientists, and, but instead you've just changed the base mechanic of movement and everything, which really just obviously changes the entire game. But it's still continuing a lot of those ideas that were from Q that we've got to recognize as Q games. Yeah, I think uh, the scientists actually look look pretty pretty much exactly the same. <laughs> but uh, actually, the we've the solved what scientists are... look like. If it's if we. We know what they look like now. That's yeah. fine. We don't have to change it again. There's not much variation you can do in a scientist, really. Um, exactly. But actually, the the concept art was from our a guy that Eddie works with worked with on a couple of small projects, and yeah. So I guess it was kind of done independently. It just it just turned out to look kind of similar. There's a there's a guy in Germany that does uh yeah. I think his art's really great, and he actually does the art for this part time. So I'm I'm doubly impressed by his work. So do you do you contract any local people or is it you find more international? Um, for the art guy, yeah, he's in Germany and our sound guy's in the US. Um, I guess we're just open to contracting any anyone yeah. who, who mm. is capable and fun to work with. Um, well, that really is the thing. Is you have so many teams now that are just spread across the entire world because yeah. we can do it. We can use source control and we can teleconference and things like this. And <laughs> yeah, you know, other than not being able to play Joust, which is important. <laughs> um, <laughs> I really want to play Joust. It's pretty tricky. Yeah, just just um, if you ever come back to Australia, just come by. I've got Joust. We'll we'll, we'll set it up. It'll be great. <laughs> Actually, I might I might call you on that because I'll be there in a, like a month and a half for a week or two. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Come on down to Clayfield. That's where all of the fun <laughs> gaming happens. Uh, um, so, how, how did you um, how did you first get over to Japan, anyway? Uh, by plane. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Not boat. <laughs> this is going to be one of those aggressive, facetious <laughs> interviews now. I can tell. <laughs> uh, no, so I, I kind of like language stuff, and I was mm-hmm. studying a little bit of Japanese and. I just kind of want to change the scene, so I just decided. Yeah. One year from now, I'll go to Japan, and then one year later, I came to Japan. And didn't have any plan, but that was kind of the the plan was to not have a plan. It was just mm-hmm. throw myself in a new environment and figure it out. Is there a pretty yeah. big expat community over there? Um. Not not so big. Uh, I mean, there's a, around Kyoto. There's a university, and you, you kind of get a lot of like international stuff around the university mm-hmm. students, I think. Um, but yeah, how long did you uh, survive uh, with kind of like with with poor Japanese skills before you picked them up? Uh, I guess I studied pretty heavily in the first year or so, and mm. for, for maybe like the first six months or a year, I, I kind of avoided English wherever I could. You know meant like turning down like let's go for dinner invites and stuff from colleagues but I, I think it paid off mm. yeah and so how long do you, did, it, did it take you does it get proficient uh, I think within a year if you're studying you can you can speak pretty comfortably mm. so I, I know we're becoming the, the, the language podcast now instead of the game but um, we, did you have any other uh, experience with other languages other than English before you decided to Get into that? Uh, nope. This is my first. Oh, language. good. That gives, that gives me hope because I'm all, I always regret the fact that I don't. I know only know one language, and I feel it's too late for me. <laughs> no, I'm I'm working on Chinese now. That's uh, ambitious. Yeah, actually, on top of English and Japanese, it's not it's not too much of a, a problem. The Japanese is it sort of like your gateway into learning Chinese? Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> the ga- gateway language. <laughs> Now you'll hit the hard stuff. Next up, yeah, what is it? Finnish, which is just whoa, 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 Finnish, whoa, just like I think that's the language that just changes incredibly rapidly. And if you leave the country for a decade, you will have difficulty when you return. <laughs> I think it was Finnish. I'm not sure. I'm, I'm no language expert on that one. Uh, okay, so at the moment, Nova, um, what are we looking for uh, schedule-wise and trying to get this out? Um. We're, we're maybe, I guess, close to halfway. The core mechanics are okay. We just need to build uh, some more worlds. So definitely before the end of the year, but hopefully a couple yep. of months before the end of the year. I think Eddie keeps saying fall, but uh, I get my seasons mixed up, so I, that's probably <laughs> four. 
<laughs> so, which summer then, or which it, winter? Who? It, is it a financial year or a, a regular year? It gets confusing. Yeah. And it, yeah, he he says it from the American perspective, so it confuses me. Yeah. Have to wait for that sometimes. Um, and I, I probably could just look at this, but I'll just instead of using my eyes and Google us. Uh, what platforms are you? Is Nova being aimed at? Uh, so first up is PC, Mac, Linux. Um, mm. I mean because we dev on PC, you know, it just, it just, it works already. Uh, after that, we Space are, release, yeah. we are open to to any platforms really. Mm. Uh, it's just a matter of where the demand is, and I, I think it would look cool on a Vita. Um, yeah, I was going to say, my demand is Vita. <laughs> so if, if I'm yeah, a big I, enough market, then... Uh, I hear it, uh, yeah, I hear that a lot, so I think it'll be the right fit. It's, you know, it's not a, it's not a huge, like, AAA game. It's, it's kind of bite-sized levels, mm. and you can kind of just pause it and pick it up later. Plus, everything looks good on that screen. Yeah, like, I think so. Yeah, I mean, it's a nice level, by the way. Thanks. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, how do we solve this one? Uh, you just duck. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to see if I can break it. Oh, no, there it goes. Yeah. Everything's right. exploding. This is our, uh, this is our little level editor. Just kind of paint walls and... Uh, is there any thought towards making a um, available uh, level editor to the public? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty open to the idea of doing that. Uh, I mean, if it's, you know... As is, I think it would probably be pretty usable. Mm. So. It looks very clean from what you've got there. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's then, um, pretty easy to quickly prototype some ideas. Yeah, design oh. some puzzles, get pe- get Steam Steam Workshop integration. Mm. Yeah, everyone's playing your game for six uh, years straight. Yeah, <laughs> no, no nice deal breaks like, or anything. We could have uh, you know, like shout outs to the some cool level designs that people did or mm. stuff like that. I'm going to show you some of the secret enemies. Oh, it's a, it's a gelatinous cube? Pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> so there's lots uh, of experimental stuff. Um, mm-hmm. Lots of programmer art things. and You can see, uh, you can see that I'm not the artist here. <laughs> That's better than I do. Well, no. <laughs> Oh, you, oh, getting blacked out. Oh, I, I do love things that... Experiments. <laughs> no, I, I love elements that, like, um, basically just make the game more difficult to play. They're not actually affecting how it's moving. It's like, oh, yeah, yeah. So you're blacked out now. Work something out. So on his, uh, on his own, was, he's he's harmless, right? You just you just bump into yeah. him. But if there's real-time stuff going on, like, you know, that, that, could, be, that could be a very yeah. dangerous situation. You can't see all of a sudden. Oh. See, it's just full oh. of it's full of little experiments here. Yeah, I'm so getting excited it's... just looking at all the little <laughs> yeah everything that comes up. So yeah, we, we tried to make a system that we can prototype and experiment very easy, mm. uh, and then we sort of refine it into our, our final stage. Have you um in the process of experimenting, have you discovered things that you think are awesome but don't fit this game that now you really want to do with something else? Ah. That's a good question. I can't actually uh, think of anything think so. offhand, though. <laughs> that's, what, that's what I always have on a project. You brainstorm and you come up with amazing things, but only some of them fit the actual project you're doing. So, uh, Actually, the, the real-time element itself was an accident. So uh, <laughs> originally it was uh, just going to be turn-based. And then the latch enemy, we wanted to try and make him more dangerous somehow. Hmm. And we weren't really sure. We're like, oh, maybe we should do damage like every two seconds or something. Like, oh, that, that's kind of interesting. And then we just kind of kept exploring with that mechanic. So yeah, uh, that and that's accidents. now become yeah, it has the entire identity of the game. Yeah, fantastic. Okay, um, I think I'm going to start bringing this to a close now. So James, you have any final questions? Uh, yeah, just a quick one. I noticed one of the resources is science. <laughs> yes, I love that. <laughs> what's what's science? Science. Uh, okay, so <clears throat> when when you use the abilities, it consumes the science points, and uh, it recharges as you wait for turns. So you can kind of wait quickly to recharge quickly, 
but you know if there's enemies around that's consuming a lot of turns. Mm. Uh, basically, it's just a way to not have infinite ability. But also, if you if you are upgrading your your beam, for example, um, you can you can sort of over science, I guess, <clears throat> and charge it up for for longer, which gives you a, a longer and stronger beam. Um, but it also takes more time to charge up. So in real time environments, oh, yeah, yeah. you kind of have to balance that as well. Ooh. Yeah. Oh, works well. And um, as has become tradition, weirdly, on the, like, the last three interviews, uh, yeah. now's your opportunity to ask us a question if you really wish. No pressure. Uh, Just a for some reason. <laughs> <laughs> um, That's all right. Okay, it's not uh, actually a thing. You can do it. <laughs> it's just a joke, but you can. I don't mind. So when you look at the game, what's the, uh, the most confusing part? And what's the, the part that you're most interested in seeing more about? Uh, well, I saw at least there was a bunch of I saw there was a bunch of pictures of avatars, but it wasn't hundred percent what they were for. Like a parrot. Oh, this is them all unrescued. Oh, so there's a yeah, actually they oh, have the artwork either. somewhere. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, um, no. So that's the portraits of the scientists. Um, of all the scientists you're going to rescue, and the animals are maybe the secret scientists that, <laughs> that nobody should know about. <laughs> so you can see here, like... Hey, don't, look, don't look at the secret scientists. Quick, get it off. I'll click off. There we go. Done. Solved. Yeah. So uh, I, I, I like to imagine that they're, they're like super ultra-intelligent scientists. You know, like super... A hyper-intelligent scientist bear. <laughs> Yeah. Bears make everything better. Um, in my case, really, just when I first saw the game, like just yeah. to be yeah. serious, here, I re I had to read like three articles until I understood the basics of the combination of real time and yeah. and um, turn based. Uh, so that's like the hard, like when I said like the hardest thing there. And then at the same time, that's yeah. the entire reason that I'm excited. Well, yeah. Visually as well. Visually is why I stayed with it to find out what it was. Yeah. But um. Yeah. But then you actually it's like, oh, I want to know the possibilities. I want to see like an example of a crazy level using both it, both things. Like I want to see like the extreme of what could be thought of. That's okay, I see. Yeah. But either way, I'm already yeah. on board, so you don't have to please me. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's there's a lot of it's kind of hard to convey simply. Uh. Yeah, that's mm. something we definitely need to work on. I think. Uh, as for the the really cool mixes of levels, yeah, that, that's a good idea. We should definitely uh, once we have some of the laboratory prototypes with some cool stuff, I think uh, maybe we'll do some little videos or something that show some of the wacky combinations. Hmm. I mean, it's actually just been great having the playthrough sort of going here as we're talking because I, like I I, I thought I had it before and I pretty much did for the basics, but I've, there's yeah. so many more just little mechanics there and I understand the flow of the game now. I mean, but at the moment, you're still a while off, so you, while off, so it's not like you need to get um, people understanding the full levels and everything yet, or they'll get burned yeah. out. So, like, like, one or two months into the dev, we had the first sort of stage done, the first, like, flow of scenes, and we, we just kind of got a blind playtest on it, and then we kind of did that, like, once a week, get somebody new on the game and try to refine that early experience, but mm. there's still ongoing work. But I think the core of the game is, is kind of getting there. We just need to ramp up the content. we got the dog scientist. <laughs> <laughs> Golden retriever. You yeah. saved me! <laughs> oh, that's, a, that's a nice little touch that just gives us so much personality. I really like that. Anyway, okay. So thank you very much for joining us today. No problem. Excellent. Um... This has been Elevator Pitch, all that jazz, normal podcast. You can go listen to us on our website and our Twitter and Facebook and all that stuff that I talk about. Um, I have been Paul. And I've been James. Okay. And Wait. once more, thank you very much for joining us, Kayla. And just, I'll, I'll, oh, yeah, we'll bring up the Nova 11D1. <laughs> <laughs> uh, check it out. It's very cool. Uh, and we'll catch you guys later. Yeah. Okay. Thank you.